So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. My name is Michael Glickman. I'm the president and CEO. And we have a really special program for you this evening. A little bit about the museum before we go into the program. This is the third largest Holocaust museum in the world. And we bring together collections that really span the ages of time and help tell the story of survivors and victims from a perspective that does not necessarily focus on the perpetrator, but really helps to envision how to teach the lessons of the Holocaust in a way that allows children and adults and others to understand what it was that took place. And so we hope that you will take an opportunity to visit this institution and see the galleries and see the exhibitions and come back for programming. This is one of our season's first programs. And so we are really quite pleased to have a very distinguished panel here this evening. After Charlottesville is a program that we were compelled to be able to provide and present. We're live streaming this evening, so we want to welcome those who are online and joining us via Facebook Live. And with that, I am going to turn this over to Dahlia, our moderator, who will introduce the program. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Michael. My name is Dahlia Lithwick. I cover the courts and the law for Slate Magazine, and I'm just delighted to moderate uh, this event here at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, and I want to welcome the folks who are streaming online. Um, we're going to leave time at the end to ask questions of our amazing guests, and I think they'll pass out note cards uh, so, so you'll be able to write your questions down. Um, but this evening, we're here to talk about the violence that took place a year and two months ago in Charlottesville uh, and the lawsuit that was filed in response to that uh, against the white supremacist and alt-right organizers who spearheaded the thing. Um, I lived in Charlottesville for 17 years. That was my hometown. That was my synagogue, my children had their bresses in that synagogue, which they don't like me to remind people of, uh, and their bar mitzvahs. So this um, hits incredibly close to home for me. Um, unfortunately, while the Unite the Right rally that happened on August 11th and 12th in Charlottesville was certainly uh, an extreme manifestation of the problem. It is by no means uh, an isolated incident. Earlier this year, the Anti-Defamation League released a study showing, quote, an alarming increase in white supremacist propaganda at universities around the country. Jewish Week has reported that according to this ADL survey, there was a 258% increase in incidents of white supremacist propaganda on college campuses during the fall 2017 semester alone uh, as compared to the year before. And according to the Chronicle of Higher Education's coverage of the ADL sur survey, the group Identity Europa, one of the defendants in the lawsuits we'll discuss tonight, has been responsible single-handedly for about half of the incidents of white supremacist propaganda that we're seeing on college campuses since 2016. The propaganda that the ADL was referencing includes attacks on blacks, Jews, Muslims, immigrants, the LBGT community, and other minority groups. And just this past weekend, for the second time in only 18 months, the Jewish Community Center of Northern Virginia was vandalized by someone spray painting 19 swastikas on the building early on Saturday morning. And I'm sure you also saw Vassar and UC campuses um, papered with anti-Semitic literature over the weekend as well. The president of that Northern California Jewish Center then said, quote, this is becoming a regular thing. It's in the air around us. It's in the country around us. And that is the chilling thought we're here to discuss tonight. Many of you have seen footage of the Unite the Right rally and the events that we're going to be discussing this evening. So before we start this evening's discussion, we are going to review just a short clip. I think, Karen, you've got the clicker there. This was obtained by Vice Media from that August weekend. And I just want to warn you, the images are indeed disturbing. So we're going to watch them for a moment, and then we will have our conversation. Oh, that was a fake clicker.
So just sit with those images for a minute and think about the fact that for most of us who saw that and who lived through that, there was not a solution immediately available other than rage and horror. But tonight we're going to talk about a really path-breaking lawsuit that was filed uh, on behalf of 10 residents of Charlottesville, um, some of them victims of the events we just saw. And the lawsuit was made possible in large part by a nonprofit that's called Integrity First for America, who's funding the case as part of its mission to protect civil rights and secure equal justice for all. With IFA's help, an amazing team of trial lawyers from three important law firms uh, have worked on this case and they will try it before a jury in Charlottesville next year. And so two of the Leviathan lawyers who have spearheaded this lawsuit are here with us this evening, um, Roberta Kaplan and Karen Dunn. And I have long introductions for both of them, but uh, suffice to say, they are both my heroes. Uh, they are both of them just absolutely formidable attorneys, each in their own right. Uh, Robbie is the founding partner at the law firm of Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink LLP, and has been described as every single kind of powerhouse litigator you could ever see, and has won every award you could ever know. Karen Dunn is a partner at Boys Schiller. She is one of America's top trial lawyers, uh, and she is called a modern major general. Uh, she is an expert at crisis management and has uh, regularly been tapped to lead presidential debate prep, including for President Obama and candidate Hillary Clinton. Uh, again, Karen has won every single uh, award known to humanity. Um, and I want to just point out, they both keep making lists of top most uh, uh, impressive female lawyers. But in my view, they, you can take the female out. They are two of the top lawyers in this country. And uh, it's really a thrill to welcome them. So welcome to Robbie. Welcome to Karen. And, and I want to start by asking you, you saw what we saw on August 11th and 12th, and instead of crying, uh, you decided to file a lawsuit. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about that thinking? Sure. So I, let me just say at the outset that it, for me it's the... the kind of sense of seriousness and frankly of sadness, but of determination is very palpable. I, I've never spoken about this case in a Holocaust museum before, um, but the, the, the motivation behind this was very much shaped by my background. So let me do a very teeny bit about that and then explain how the case started. Um, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, um, in a Jewish community that's not that different or wasn't that different than the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, almost everyone I knew was Jewish. It was highly concentrated. There's a gazillion temples in Cleveland. Um, and I grew up in the 70s, and so my education at Temple, my Jewish education was, and I'm being slightly joking, but not that much, was Holocaust, 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 and then some, maybe some more Holocaust. Um, and, and I remember thinking to myself as a kid a lot, because kids do this kind of stuff, like what would I have done if I had lived in Europe in those years what would I have had the courage to do what Hannah Senesch or others did? Could I, what would I have done? And I, I remember like s staying up in bed as a, as a teenager and thinking about things like that. Flash forward many, many years, and it's August of last year, and I had just opened, uh, literally we were in our brand new offices for my law firm. I'd spent many, many years as a partner at, at Paul Weiss. We were like kind of hanging out on card tables in, our, in, in the office, and Charlottesville happened. And I kind of made a mistake because I decided that we were going to kind of watch the video and watch the, press, the president's press conference live uh, with the people, the six of us. There was probably only six of us then who were working in the office. And we did, and it was a mistake because some of the people got very, very upset and had to leave. And I thought to myself, it, my, my moniker in the law firm is Robbie Axe which I think is probably a fair way to describe me, and I was like, something needs to happen here, something needs to be done. And immediately I thought of a case that my mentor um, at Paul Weiss, a phenomenal trial lawyer by the name of Marty London, had done years ago 
uh, together with Maria Vulo, who's the head of Department of Financial Services today, against a website uh, called the Nuremberg Files. It's funny how the Nazi stuff keeps coming up, right? The Nuremberg Files, which posted, this is really pre kind of early internet days, the pictures, photos, and the personal information, including home addresses, for doctors who performed abortions in the West. And when bad things would happen to those doctors, and I think at least one of them was killed, uh, and a red X would go over their faces on the website. And, and Marty and Maria brought a case to shut that down. And I thought to myself, God, something like that needs to happen here. So um, I, called, I knew Dahlia had lived in Charlottesville. I immediately picked up the phone and called Dahlia and said, I have this idea. What do you think? She immediately agreed. Within 48 hours, I think, we were on a plane. She, she called a bunch of folks down there, and we were on a plane down meeting with people, including some of the plaintiffs in our case today. Um, and then when I realized it was real and that we needed to do something, um, I knew I wasn't going to do it alone, and I knew I needed the tough, the only lawyer in this country tougher than me, um, <laughs> who is Karen Dunn, who I really had kind of been a fangirl from afar. We knew each other, but not very well, and I called her up out of the blue and said, hi, I'm Robbie Kaplan. How'd you like to bring this case suing Nazis about Charlottesville? Um, and she immediately agreed. And Karen should tell you a little bit about the legal theory that we came up with, which is different than the Nuremberg Files case, um, but I think equally powerful. Yeah, so uh, this case is going to be tried. Uh, first of all, we're going to trial. Uh, there's no settlement to be had uh, with the 25 white supremacist groups and individuals that we have sued. So I, I think, you know, in a lot of cases these days, they, you know, it's big companies against other big companies, and uh, Robbie and I work on lots of those, and we love them. Uh, and sometimes they go to trial, and sometimes they don't. With this case, uh, we are sure to go to trial in the Western District of Virginia, which includes Charlottesville, but is not limited to Charlottesville. So we actually are going to trial in a very large district in Virginia. Um, and I was, in addition to being a lawyer now in private practice who does civil cases, I used to be a federal prosecutor in the Eastern District of Virginia, uh, where I did uh, a variety of cases, including national security cases, uh, some of which bear some relationship to the case that we, will, that we are bringing here. Um, our case is really uh, a case that has never before been seen, in part because events like this have have never before been seen in this country. Uh, one of the statutes that we rely upon is the Ku Klux Klan Act, uh, which is from the Civil War Reconstruction period. And it makes us really sad every time we have to say that because how is it possible that these statutes are operative now and are the basis of our legal theory now? Uh, but luckily they're around. Sadly, we have to use them. And the, the primary theory that we are bringing is a conspiracy theory. Uh, we have uh, brought the case only against the people who are the organizers and the leaders, the individuals and the groups who are the organizers and the leaders of these events. Because these events that you saw, obviously there are plenty more people than the 25 groups and individuals that we have sued. But these events were planned, they were plotted, they were premeditated. Uh, and that takes coordination, it takes coordination among people. And so uh, we have put together a case that is very large in scope uh, for a criminal case or a civil case. Uh, and the reason we have done that is because we want to explain how these people coordinated and worked together in order to create these very non-spontaneous events that happened and did harm to real people in Charlottesville. So, so let me ask about that because I think, you know, what the, the, the initial permit was granted in Charlottesville by a trial court judge who looked at the issues and was asked uh, at the 11th hour to move the rally away from, from uh, downtown Charlottesville to a park that was uh, quite, quite removed from it. He said no, and he analyzed it purely on First Amendment free speech terms. He said, there's no issue here other than free speech and Skokie. 
and you know, Skokie being the landmark case that says that it doesn't matter if you're a Nazi, speech is speech. You're trying, I think, to get around the claims that there's just an unfettered free speech right to get on the internet and say, lock and load, let's go kill some Jews, but it is still a free speech problem, right? Well, uh, we actually have argued part of this already in front of the judge who's gonna hear our case. So our, our case is before uh, a judge who's been on the bench a long time in the Western District of Virginia, and- Who's not the judge who approved that permit, just right, to be different, clear. Different judge. Um, uh, well, whose name we will not announce in this video. <laughs> um, but he's a very respected judge in, in the Western District, been on the bench a long time. And he, uh, he heard the defendant's motions to dismiss, some of them filed to dismiss the case. Uh, we argued both that First Amendment is not a defense to what happened, and we or argued affirmatively our conspiracy claims. And when it comes to the First Amendment, and Robbie and I are huge believers in the First Amendment. We like to talk a lot. Um, <laughs> and so we, we believe in, in free speech just as much as the next person. Uh, what is not protected under the First Amendment, uh, never has been, is violence. So if you engage in a conspiracy to do violence, your words, your agreement in the conspiracy, and the communications that you use in order to put your plan into action and execute on that plan, those are not protected. And the judge in our case has very clearly already said that violence is not protected under the First Amendment. And so uh, there will be, uh, we do not expect that the defendants are just going to abandon their First Amendment defense. Um, but what happened here is not the matter of a small demonstration on a street corner uh, where people want their views to be known. This was a very coordinated plan to do violence and then execute on that violence, which is what happened. And so I think it's very important, and Dahlia, I'm very glad that you asked that question because I think it is very important that people understand the difference between those two things. It is, uh, it is very much, um, uh, uh, red herring is sort of maybe not the exact right thing, but it, 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 the defendants in this case are gonna throw up the First Amendment as if somehow we are on the other side of that, and we are not. Uh, and so far the judge is not, is not buying that. I mean, I, I guess another way to think about it is while we all, I assume most people here, find their views to be odious, we agree that their views are protected by the First Amendment. They have every right to believe what they want to believe about Jews being, you know, need to gas Jews again and the Holocaust to happen again. And by the way, guys, let me just be real clear for those of you who are Jews here, we are not white for these people. Just to be crystal clear, we are not part of the white race for them. We are a race that needs to be eradicated just the way Hitler thought that, our, that Jews need to be eradicated. So I find those views obviously horrifying. I can't think of anything more evil. Under the First Amendment, they're entitled to have them, and they're even entitled to speak about them. We don't even disagree with that. What they're not entitled to do is motivated by those beliefs, plan this elaborate plan to commit violence against Jewish people, African American people, gay people, and all their supporters in Charlottesville. And that's what they did, you know, down to the details of talking about which weapons to bring and which weapons not to bring. And you can, you, you can read our complaint for the detail. I'm sure we'll talk about it. But you can't even imagine how elaborate the planning was for this. Can, can you actually help um, clarify why you p picked these 25 defendants? I mean, everyone in that video seems like they might be on the hook for something. Uh, how did you sort of limit the scope to the 25 named defendants? So we, we couldn't sue everyone. Obviously, there are practical limitations. Um, and we really wanted to focus on the leadership. And, and this is a very unique conspiracy, at least as far as we know, because it was a conspiracy that was planned on the internet. You know, the, the technology today, as we all read about, is both, to quote the Torah, both a blessing and a curse, right? And um, uh, the curse part of it is it enabled these guys, living all over the country, most of them were not from the surrounding area, uh, to plan on a chat room that was formerly a gamer chat room called Discord um, uh, in these private message groups. Uh, and there were a variety of them. They had a message group for transportation and a message group for leadership and a message group for what, how to, what uniforms which different groups were wearing. 
and to spend literally many, many, many weeks and these membership only, they had to, you had to be accepted into these groups, planning in these chat rooms how they were gonna do this. And then lucky for us, um, a lot of their chats got exposed to the public. So we uh, spent a lot of time reading those chats and based on their communications, we tried to determine who the leaders were and what the leadership organizations were and that's how we chose the defendants we chose. And, and Karen, what do, you, what do you do when, I know in some of the motions to dismiss, they say, oh, we weren't really planning to wear weapon. Like, we weren't really inciting. We were just boys will be boysing or whatever, <laughs> I don't know, the Nazi version, version of that is. But like, what were they, what, what do you say when they say this wasn't legitimate, you know, you, you, that's your construction of the facts. Our construction of the facts is like, we're a bunch of kind of goofy guys in our basements, you know, just talking. Yeah, so, well, I mean, as funny as that sounds, that is somewhat like their defense. I mean, they, they say that these things that they say, these are just edgy jokes. They're just edgy jokes. Um, and so, what we did, at, and at the motion to dismiss stage, this is a little, for anyone who doesn't happen to be a lawyer, I'm sure gonna be fascinating, but you take the facts as the plaintiffs have pled them as true, and then you decide if they are true, uh, do the plaintiffs have a legal claim that can survive to the next stage? So, Robbie and I and our fabulous team still have the burden of proving our case, but the judge has said that taken as true, uh, plaintiff's allegations would state a claim and the, and the case can move forward. And so what we did in order to show that, and, and uh, Robbie, I think, handled this very well at the hearing, was to explain to the judge what each person had done uh, as a member of the conspiracy and to really lay out uh, paragraph by paragraph in detail what everyone's role was and how they participated. Uh, and we did have some conversation with the judge about that at the hearing, and he was very interested to know um, how are you going to tie each person to the conspiracy. Um, and so, you know, actually one of the people did not make it. Uh, there was one, and which shows actually that the rest of them deserved <laughs> to go ahead to trial because one person, you know, was, was dismissed from the case. Um, and so I do think, I think it's a great question because I think that a lot of thought was given uh, precisely to your question about whether these individuals should proceed uh, to, you know, we're going to go through discovery and get as much information as we can from them and about them. Uh, and then after that, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll be in trial prep. So, so this is just a, a question that I want to ask as somebody who lived in Charlottesville. You know, we had went to three Nazi marches last summer and uh, a KKK rally. It was a really banner summer, um, and, and tourism, by the way, still hasn't recovered. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, and I, and I want to tease this out with the both of you, is that all of them sort of purport to be white supremacists. This is allegedly, it goes a little bit to Robbie's point about they see Jews as not white. They sort of purport to just equally hate all the people they hate, but boy, all the signs are about Jews, the chanting is about Jews, you know, the, there's really, uh, fascinatingly at the KKK rally, uh, which happened in July, every one of the signs was about Jews. Like the KKK was very focused on this, and I wonder if you can help us understand. It's a, it's a strange thing. There's a tiny little synagogue and a handful of Jews in Charlottesville. It is a southern city with a massive African American and immigrant population. Am I misreading the fact that at least the sign makers are disproportionately obsessed with Jews and the synagogue? Uh, no, and it's the same is true for their Discord chats. I, I actually, this is something about the case as we kind of get deeper into it that I'm kind of constantly amazed by and shocked by, and, and frankly, we all should be. Um, they hate a lot of groups, there's no question about it, um, but their animating hatred appears to be anti-Semitism. Um, they, most of what they say, or a lot of what they say, is about hatred for the Jews. Blood and soil, as we all know, was a Nazi slogan. Jews will not replace us, you heard them say. Um, and I, 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 I still struggle with it to, to this day. I find it absolutely astonishing. I think not only 
all, everything you said about Charlottesville is true, Dahlia, but I have to assume most of these guys live in places in the country, rural areas, where there are no Jews, or very few Jews. They're not living on the Upper West Side, <laughs> or Cleveland. So, so it's just astonishing to me um, how much uh, of their motivation seems to be not only present anti-Semitism, but a very, very potent admiration and look back at what happened in Nazi Germany in the Holocaust. There's, there's no getting around that, guys. That is, that is what motivates them. That's what gets them out of bed every day, is to reinstitute the Holocaust in this country. I, I want to just tell folks who are watching on Facebook Live that if you have questions for our panelists, um, write them down, and um, someone will pick them up, uh, along with the questions that are being written in the room. Karen, I wonder if you could, just to amplify that point, um, CBI, the synagogue, gets swept into your lawsuit. Can you kind of help folks understand what the impacts on CBI uh, were on August 11th and 12th? Well, actually, I'm going to pass this question over to Robbie, who okay. I think has spent a lot more time uh, talking to folks at the synagogue. I think she'll be able to give a much better answer. Yeah, so when we took that trip down there only a few days after, we met with folks at the synagogue, we went to the synagogue, um, the sense of fear uh, was palpable, um, and I think it still is, is my understanding. Um, uh, where the main incidents on Saturday occurred, where the Robert E. Lee statute is, is only about a block and a half, maybe two blocks, kind of catty-cornered away from the synagogue. Um, and there's a, a, a day school there, a nursery school, and kids go, and they used to play in that park. Um, and what happened on Saturday is that these guys were all roaming around right in the vicinity of the synagogue. And so enormous numbers of measures were taken. Um, uh, the, the time of Shabbat services that Saturday morning were changed. Um, before that Saturday, they only left one scroll in the synagogue. The other scrolls were removed from the building. Think about this, guys. Removed from the building and hidden. Um, there is a Holocaust scroll at the synagogue that's kind of behind glass in a, in a exhibit because, you know, we can't read from Holocaust scrolls, but it's, it's on display there. Um, and they couldn't remove it because the way it's on display is because it's very fragile. And one of uh, the people we talked to down there who's a member of the synagogue said how ironic it seemed to her that a scroll that was dug up after the Holocaust, dug up from being buried from the Nazis, is again being threatened by Nazis. Um, and, and I just can't overstate how incredibly scared uh, the members of that synagogue were and I think still are. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I will tell uh, one nice story that I just happened to know, which is that on Shabbat morning, on the Saturday morning, uh, having made the decision to change the time of services and to, to, to get out early, and by the way, they had to sneak out the side entrance, they couldn't go out the front entrance, but there were um, some like ex-Navy SEALs, there were some of the amazing African-American women from the um, Black Baptist Church who came and sat and just sat in solidarity um, and basically said, you know, we're going to be here with you. And it was an extraordinary, one of the stories that doesn't get told nearly enough about Charlottesville is the faith community that was across the boards from every denomination standing uh, together. And that was one of the rays of hope, at least uh, for those of us who are just looking for something to feel good about. Karen, can you talk about the other plaintiffs in the suit? Yeah, so um, we have uh, plaintiffs that sort of come from all parts of the Charlottesville community, and they all cover different parts of the events of the weekend. Um, I think the, there are two plaintiffs who we talk about probably most frequently um, because one of them was in the photo that has become very uh, emblematic of what happened in Charlottesville for most people. It was that Pulitzer Prize winning photo where you see the car uh, driven by our defendant Fields uh, hit an African American male who was just sort of like on top of the hood of the car as he's being hit. And uh, he is one of our plaintiffs, as is 
his now wife, but at the time his fiance, who he had pushed out of the way of the oncoming car. And what she will say is that uh, she turned around and just saw his baseball cap lying on the ground, thought he was dead. Uh, and turns out he saved her life. And uh, if you talk to them, you talk to any of these plaintiffs, this is also really a ray of hope. That Dolly, like what Dolly is talking about with the faith community there. These people are so courageous to bring this lawsuit, to put their names on the lawsuit, to do that while they still live in Charlottesville. Keep in mind, everyone, this was called Charlottesville 2.0. And what that means is that before there was Charlottesville 2.0, there was Charlottesville 1.0. And it also means that there was intended to be Charlottesville 3.0. And so our plaintiffs uh, stood up to that. And the reason they are doing that is because they don't want anybody to have to go through what they went through again. And they want there to be a very clear statement that our laws do not protect this. And so every time anyone tells Robbie or me, it's so great what you're doing. Really, I mean, uh, we don't we don't deserve any any compl you know unusual appreciation. The plaintiffs in this case are making really an enormous personal sacrifice and putting themselves on the line. They are going to have to go to a trial where they uh, relive what happened to them, uh, and so some of them have physical injuries and some of them have uh, all of them probably have psychological injuries. And so what they have elected to do, I think, is so courageous and so inspiring. And that is one of the reasons that we get up in the morning to do what we are doing. If you saw in that video, that video was from Friday night uh, on the UVA campus. And two of our plaintiffs were kids who were surrounding that statute, it's a Thomas Jefferson statute, um, surrounded by those guys wielding lit tiki torches. Um, that they were throwing, trying to throw the fuel and throw the lit torches on them. I just, I don't, I don't know how anyone can really get over that. I think they, they all thought they, thought they were going to die. Yeah. Also, this is a great defense. They'll say, oh, well, we weren't throwing fuel near these lit torches. We were flowing, throwing unidentified liquid. <laughs> well, that's comforting. <laughs> And, and that is why you, you won on the motion to dismiss. Right. <laughs> that's, the, that's the high power oh, argument well, right, that's being exactly. advanced. That's the, right. Can, that's why we got hired, to think of things like that. Can, can, I ask, can I ask a question that maybe isn't entirely fair? Um, but I think there are two stories that are told post-Charlottesville, and I, I have trouble reconciling. One is... Ugh, these guys are just losers, right? They're kind of guys, they're in the basement, they have big dreams, they talk big, they showed up, they realized that, you know, they're all losing their jobs and their parents are embarrassed. And, you know, this was sort of the death rattle of, of a kind of a, a sad culture that is not really worth suing. I mean, they don't have money and they don't have, you know, anything that you are going to win. And then there's another story, which is what we open with, which is there is a massive uptick in this country of something that is not just losers in their basements. There is genuine, terrifying uh, alt-right sentiment. And, and, and it has to be stopped, and this is a way to stop it. And I, I guess I'm sort of asking you to help me understand in my own head which of those two stories is true? I mean, there wasn't a Charlottesville 3.0 in August, and I think a lot of folks took that to mean, like, good, you scared them. This is over. Should I go, who wanted me to go first? You go. Okay, so this is going <laughs> to be controversial, but I get paid to be controversial, so I'm going I'm to say it. The argument that they were all just jokers in their basements, losers, was the same argument, guys, that was made about the Nazis in Germany in the 1930s. Let's not make that mistake again. Yeah, some of them were losers. Some of the Nazis in Nazi Germany were losers, but they took over a country and they did what they did. I'm not saying that these guys are close to that, but the way to stop it is to do what we're doing and to stand up and fight. Um, so, I, I, you know, some of it's true in the sense that, I, you know, none of these guys are Nobel Prize winners, for sure. Um, but 
we've seen in history when, when groups of men, mostly men, there are some women, but mostly men uh, like that have done in the past in the, the horrible damage they can, re they can cause. Do you wanna add anything, Karen? Or? Well, I mean, look, so I'm a lawyer and uh, I'm a trial lawyer and I care about the facts about what actually happened. And so uh, that is not really consistent with people idly hanging around in their basement doing nothing in particular um, that impacts humanity. So, uh, you know, one person died and lots of people were grievously injured in a way that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. So I don't, you know, for me, when I look at this, I don't really spin out my imagination too far. I see actual things that happen to real people uh, that could easily happen again. And that there are many people who have every intent of having them happen again. And because of that intent in the first place, um, they didn't make a secret of this. Everybody, they just said exactly what they were going to do and then they did it. So I do think that we would be foolish to, uh, you know, when somebody tells you they're gonna do something and then they do it, and then they say they're gonna do it again, it's kind of silly to say, well, I don't know, maybe this time they won't do it, right? They've proven themselves. They have proven themselves. And I think we really have to pay attention to that. Can we talk for a minute, and then we'll open it up um, to audience questions. And if there are not um, index cards going around, um, maybe we'll start to circulate them, and, and folks can write out their questions. But um, your complaint in this is just a, astonishing filing. I think I read it on a train, uh, sobbing, because it is a graphic representation of, I mean, there's photographs and there's screen grabs of, of chats. I mean, it doesn't look like a pleading that I, I read a lot of legal pleadings. This was a, a, a sort of artifact. This was an extraordinary document. And I, I wonder a little bit, I mean, I, I have a hundred questions about it, but mostly I wonder who was your audience for that? Were, were you writing that for the judge or were you writing that to sort of create a, 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 a picture for the country, who, by the way, I think still doesn't understand some of what you captured in that pleading. Well, so I, this is a great question. I think that um, the museum should consider sending our complaint out to anybody who wants it, because it is the first and still the only time where all the facts have been collected in one place about what happened. Uh, it is not like any pleading that I think either one of us has, have ever filed. And when Dahlia says she ran it on a train, she probably means she ran it on a train you know, from here to California, because it is really long uh, and really in depth. And in part, uh, it is what we needed to do to substantiate the scope of the conspiracy that we pled. So if you want to satisfy questions about why do 25 defendants belong in this complaint, you need, uh, you really need to, to prove that up, and that is what we were doing. Um, and the second part is that you really can't get your full head around what happened un until you see the pictures and the actual communications uh, and how violent and premeditated everything truly was. And so the complaint really uh, tries to do that. And universally, when people read this complaint, uh, they find it really uh, impactful. So I, you know, if anybody has many, many hours of nothing to do, uh, you should get it sent to you and read what actually happened because it's that's not uh, that's not something that was captured in any news article or any one video, uh, but we packaged it all up for you. And, and I would only add that you know we anticipated the defenses that we've been talking about, so we anticipated that they would say no, we were really only joking. We anticipated that they said it was only just free speech and they weren't planning anything. So we really felt an obligation to show at the outset, no, 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 that's not true. These guys were intricately planning and what, and what they planned happened. And I'll give you one example, probably the most prominent example of this. As everyone knows, James Fields uh, drove his car into the crowd of protesters and killed Heather Heyer and hurt four of our plaintiffs and, and many others. Um, that wasn't an accident. Um, in the discussions leading up to Charlottesville, there are many, many 
discussions about driving automobiles and cars and trucks into protesters. And there's intricate discussions. What would is, do you have a self-defense defense if you do this? What are the laws in Virginia about driving into protesters? There are uh, pictures uh, where they, uh, it's just horrible to say, where they have like a, a, looks like a tractor, a John Deere tractor, and they call it a protester digester. Um, so the fact that that's what James Fields did is not a surprise. In fact, that was one of their other defenses in this motion when they, when they tried to dismiss the case. They said, well, you know, yeah, judge, first of all, it's all First Amendment, and second of all, we were joking, and third of all, judge, you know, yeah, we plan to like use tiki torches, and we plan to use clubs, and we plan to use socks filled with rocks to hit protesters, but you know, we didn't plan for someone to drive into a crowd and kill someone. The first answer to that is actually you did, as I just described. But the second answer to that is what the judge said in his opinion, which is if you plan to come to Charlottesville, guys, with guns and clubs and lit tiki torches to do violence, and it just so happens that someone used an automobile as a weapon, you're liable for that. That was entirely foreseeable that that would happen, and that was a big part of the judge's decision in this case. So, so um, I think my last question for you is, is I mean, this was, when it was filed, a little bit of a Hail Mary. I mean, I think it was an incredibly ingenious but very novel uh, suit you are bringing. You've survived the first hurdle. You're gonna go to trial. What, A, what's next, and B, what is success going to look like? Like, what, what is winning going to look like? Or is it enough that you have gotten this far and that those guys are scared? Well, I do think we've achieved some success uh, already. I, I think that is un indisputably true. Um, there were certainly articles before... The, this summer Unite the Right rally where at least one of our d defendants is encouraging people not to go. And so I think we already can say we achieved some measure of success, uh, but certainly a long way from enough success. I think uh, we believe that uh, great success would be a jury verdict in our favor. Um, another piece of success could be a damages verdict uh, in favor of our plaintiffs. Uh, we don't uh, we don't know that that will happen, but that would certainly be quite wonderful for them. Um, and then, you know, we're in the discovery phase of this case, so some collateral success could be learning more about what is going on uh, and getting more information about the planning and the funding of uh, these activities. Do you have any other wishes and dreams? As Robin? always, I completely agree with Karen Dunn. And, <laughs> and the only other thing I would add is that Karen Dunn and I don't bring cases to lose. Uh, so we fully intend to win this case. So, so uh, A, we have a lot of questions, uh, and I will try to get through them quickly. Uh, but this is a question I was asked an awful lot, um, having been in Charlottesville this summer. Talk about the role Antifa played on August uh, 11th and 12th in Charlottesville. Look, it's not entirely clear to me, and I've read a lot about Charlottesville and about these, this situation, what exactly Antifa is or was. I mean, by definition, it's an anarchist group, so they don't have any structural organization. Um, there were uh, a lot of counter-protesters, understandably, who showed up, including uh, some of our clients. Uh, none of our clients were members of Antifa. Uh, they were students, they were ministers, uh, they were, uh, uh, bystanders who lived in Charlottesville and saw what happened in Friday night and felt like they had to come up uh, to stand up to the hatred in their own community. Um, uh, but the fact, you know, and, and we get this a lot in the case, there's all these kinds of blaming other things. So the, the, the argument is, okay, so there were people um, who showed up on the other side who may or may not have anarchist views and that therefore justifies what we did. That's absurd. Again, historic parallels, the same was true in, in Germany in the 30s. So that's just absurd. Another big defense we get is, oh, well, you know, we showed up and we had all these weapons and we had all these planning, but the police should have stopped us. You know, the fact that the police didn't stop us, that's the problem here. That's like saying, 
you know, the guy robbed a bank and he's not liable because the alarm system didn't work. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff is in the air. Um, suffice it to say, our focus here is on what our, the defendants in this case did, and in our view, it was clearly uh, in violation of the law. Um, a question here about um, why Charlottesville and how much the Robert E. Lee statue is the trigger uh, for all this. In other words, that certainly was at least ostensibly the cause of, you know, I will say a year and a half of unrest in town, but how closely do you sort of couple what was happening with outrage around those two statues and those two parks and the renaming of the parks and the debate about pulling down the statues and what happened? Uh, as far as our case is really, it's not played a huge role. To be honest, our case is very much focused on these events of August 11th and 12th and the planning of those events, uh, the close coordination of those events. And it is, you know, it's, there are, I think the question of why Charlottesville, we could be here for another seven hours talking about that. I mean, there are obviously a lot of dynamics that contributed, and Dahlia, I'm sure you have your own views on that. But, um, but the, tr the truth is we are, you know, we're not going to have two years to try this case. We're going to have a small-ish window of, of weeks. And we are going to be very focused on specifically what happened here and the planning that led up to it. Somebody thinks you're not ambitious enough. They say, how about suing Donald Trump? Because he is encouraging these types of behavior. Um, and, you know, if, if inciting is a is a problem, then he's inciting to. This is, I'm not just not going to let Ravi talk right now. I'm, I'm going to let my lawyer this answer is, this, this is, Yeah. <laughs> so this is just not a political case. And what, what Ravi and I both believe, but most especially when I talk, what we believe <laughs> is that um, people of good faith in the jury pool in the Western District of Virginia are going to reject what happened here. And that's it. doesn't matter what political party you are. This is not okay. And it's not lawful. And that's what's going to matter here. So we are, that is our collective answer to this question. I, I should also add, and I promise you're going to be okay with this answer, Okay. <laughs> I should also add that this is not an incitement case. Our case is not about anyone inciting anyone to do this. Our case is about the people actually planning to do it and then doing it. So it's a much more direct, it's a conspiracy, it's much more direct than incitement. Uh, someone from the live stream is asking, on what grounds did the judge allow for the dismissal of the charges against one of the defendants? And then there's a coda. Thank you for your good work. But Hi, Mom. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's going to appreciate that. Um, I, just to be very short, because I see the stack of questions, um, the person who was dismissed was dismissed because the judge did not find that he was significant, si substantially enough tied to the conspiracy. And, and the fundamental thing yeah. is, at least as far as we know, he wasn't, we couldn't identify him in the Discord chats. Um, these people all had handles. I, to this day, I don't know for sure, but we were not able to tie him because we, uh, as opposed to most of the other defendants. I have a, a couple of questions, and this I should have asked initially, but uh, three or four questions that ask some version of what relief or remedy are you seeking? Uh, are, are these people going to jail? What kind of punishment? Uh, so what are you asking for? Okay. You go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Um, I, Karen, I think, has already answered this. So we're, 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 they're not going to jail, at least from us. We, we, this is a civil case. We don't have the ability to put anyone in jail. Um, all that we can seek in a civil case is money damages and an order from the court and an injunction preventing them from doing any, anything like this again and uh, some kind of a declaratory judgment about what happened here and how it was illegal. Um, so that's the relief that we're seeking. That's the, all the relief that we can seek. We are not uh, either federal or state prosecutors. We don't have the ability to put anyone in jail. Um, th this is a related and also interesting question. Is there some kind of precedent you are hoping to set going forward that are going to make this kind of lawsuit easier for future plaintiffs in similar circumstances? Yeah, well, I think that any good ruling we get sets a precedent for future lawsuits. So we already have a ruling that is in our favor um, that will make these lawsuits easier to bring. And so, you know, we have every expectation that the legal rulings here are going to be held 
upheld by the Fourth Circuit. They have very good law in the Fourth Circuit about what are called true threats. Um, which are not just mere threats, but threats to do very severe violence and then to carry forth on those violence. That is, we're actually in a very good place for, for that. And so, I, you know, this is, these cases f fortunately do not have to be brought every day. Um, that's sort of the good news. Um, but if they do have to be brought in the future, anything positive that happens here is going to make it easier for future plaintiffs. Um. Has the Justice Department or any other federal agency uh, contested or gotten involved uh, or supported your suit? So obviously the jurisdiction of the Justice Department or prosecutors is different than ours. Um, uh, but there has been some activity just last week. They indicted uh, some guys who were involved in the Friday night, the events of Friday night who, who um, were from out of town and came in from a group called the, the acronym is RAM, I don't recall exactly the title right now. And so the, the government is active. Uh, they are bringing criminal cases against individuals who they believe committed crimes on those days. And they're, they're clearly still investigating. And Fields. And Fields. Yeah. And Cantwell was, was indicted and, and actually found guilty, convicted. I, I'm gonna answer this myself, because it says, if I recall, at least one of you still lives in Charlottesville. It sounds like a really awful place. <laughs> Why, why would you stay there when the majority doesn't reflect or share your values? And I'm just looking at my son, <laughs> who's 15, who was born and lived uh, in Charlottesville until last year. And I think the, the single strongest uh, sense I have is that this had nothing to do with Charlottesville locals. This was almost entirely people who came across the country uh, there was very, very little evidence, with the exception of our friend Jason Kessler, who was became the uh, ringleader. This was not the town turning on its uh, African American and Jewish citizens, and in fact, I think quite the opposite. I think the town was horrified, remains horrified. Uh, it is actually an, a completely lovely place to live, and you should all go visit and spend a lot of money at restaurants and buy t-shirts. Uh, but I think that there, one of the things that's sad about this story is it got represented as this sort of dinky, intolerant, southern town, uh, and, and my editor at Slate, Michael Kinsley, my first editor, would always call Charlottesville the Paris of the South. And I really, it is an extraordinary city. There is no, uh, I have seen no evidence to suggest that this was the town uh, acting out. I don't know if you uh, have any thoughts beyond that, but I, I feel as a 17-year Charlottesvillian, I need to say that. Um, here's a question that is, uh, Kind of uh, interesting. Do you feel any concern that moving forward with the trial is going to inspire more men and more people who are sympathetic to neo Nazis and the alt right to join the cause because you're giving them attention and publicity? We call that a gotcha question yeah, in journalism. Look, look, you know, we all live in, in a world, a morally yeah. difficult world, and there's always that argument, but what's the alternative? The alternative is to do nothing to not fight back, to not speak up, to not apply the rule of law uh, against what these guys did, and to me that's an unacceptable thing to do. Yeah. Also, just to be honest, I'm not sure they're suffering from insufficient attention. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit about the KKK Act and what, what it provides and what what your theory is related to that? Go ahead. Yeah. Want me to go? yeah. So, the, I mean, in a way, this is one of the th things about the case that I just find so sad is that the KKK Act was passed in 1871. Um, it was passed by the Reconstructionist Congress, uh, and actually, the DOJ was actually formed at this time to, to deal with the same problem, to deal with organized uh, violence against the newly freed slaves in the Deep South. Um, and it was actually passed to deal, to prevent and to prohibit under the law, ironically, exactly what happened in Charlottesville in August 2017. Um, it has not been used for many, many years. It, it's a, there's not a lot of precedents. We've read every single one of them, um, and they're not a lot. There are very few successful precedents because it, we haven't had this problem in our country until recently. Uh, but the judge agreed with us that the intention of the statute and of the 
Reconstructionist uh, members of Congress who passed it was to prevent exactly what you saw on that video screen uh, when we started. Um, a couple of versions of this question. Um, of the 25 named defendants, how many are male? Well, some of them are groups. Uh, so, but I think all of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, so there, but the, I, I, I can't just blame men here. Yeah, there's, there's, there are women involved. So we, there's an important motion that we've already won in the case against uh, a person. So we subpoenaed Discord because we want to get, we have a good sense of what their chats were, but we obviously want the whole picture. And uh, there's a woman, I don't know her name, uh, whose Discord handle, this is pretty shocking, was Crystal Knight. Um, and she brought a motion uh, seeking to quash our subpoena to, to prevent Discord from producing these chats on the ground that somehow we were trying to expose her identity and that would hurt her at her workplace and in her community. Uh, we actually, one of our responses to, to her motion was we really don't care about your identity, we just want to get the chats. Uh, but we won that motion and so I, I can't say that this is 100% men who were behind this because we know quite clearly that there were women involved. Are all the defendants being represented by the same defense team or defense attorneys, or do they all have their own attorneys? Um, they are being represented sort of in clumps. So neither one of those things is true. But so there are about three or four different lawyers that, that we deal with that among them represent everybody else. Um, there are a couple of questions that uh, I think, Robbie, you've already answered, but um, maybe I'll give um, Karen a chance to answer it if you have a different answer. But lots of questions about, well, but what about BDS and what about Antifa and what about violence on the left? Um, you know, is, is there some way in which in your head this is just different or uh, is it that this was just the lawsuit? Yeah, I, I, I would just give a similar version of the answer that Robbie gave, which is, I, I think it is really dangerous to fall into this trap that because other things are happening into the world that somehow this very patently unlawful, dangerous, and actually murderous behavior is excused. So yes, it is not surprising that when people with offensive viewpoints come together, there will be protests. That is not a surprise. Uh, it is not a surprise that when people with odious viewpoints who profess to want to do a lot of violence that the police will show up. But it does not mean that the people who have coordinated the violence and executed on their plan to do violence can then point fingers at the protesters and at the police and say those people are to blame for what we did, that we planned for months down to what we were gonna wear and eat for lunch. So that is my response to that, which is, you know, I, I think these issues deserve very robust conversation, but I, I really hold the line at this idea that somehow this is excused by looking out into the world and finding other people and things to lay blame on. Um, I, I, I could ask you the rest of this stack of questions, but I'll end with this. And uh, with just the huge caveat that um, for me, in fact, this is the first panel I've gotten through on Charlottesville where I've not cried, so that's a win. Um, but but um, the question is how, uh, if you're willing to share, how does this affect you personally and emotionally? Robbie, you talked a little bit um, about, you know, what this means in your bones from your childhood, but this is really quite, traumatizing and difficult. Um, do you, can you talk about, do you just suit up every day and say, I'm a lawyer and, and I'm gonna not let this affect me or does it like hurt? So the answer with everything is both. Yeah. Um, I'm sitting here hoping that I don't cry because I don't wanna mess up this expensive makeup job. <laughs> um, it would really It's almost ruin, over, you know, it, you it would really do it. ruin all the, all the <laughs> eye makeup I'm wearing. Um, uh, but when we went down there on that first trip uh, and met with these people and I had a, a team of my colleagues with me and I remember we were driving to the airport to go return to New York City and my two colleagues were in the car sobbing uh, as we were heading to the airport. And, and I, I, I'm not proud of this, but I'm gonna tell the truth of what I said. I said to them that they had to buck it up 
um, that we had a case to win and that we were lawyers and we were gonna do this. And, and it's not to say that anyone couldn't cry, people can cry, but they had to buck it up because this was our job. So the answer is it's both. Sometimes I wanna cry and sometimes I say to myself, you gotta buck it up, Kaplan. We're gonna, we're gonna do this thing. Um, and for my part, I, the only time I ever came close to crying in this is, is when a reporter asked me about this and I blurted out that my grandmother would be really proud of me. So that, that's another shout out for my mom and my aunt. But, um, but generally, uh, I will say I do not think about that at all. Uh, my own emotional feelings about this because I, I really, I mean, I believe this. We have a responsibility to our clients who we represent, and it is our job to stand up for them and to be strong for them every day in this lawsuit. And that is going to be extremely hard uh, when we all show up for trial next summer or this summer. And uh, that, but that, that's what we do. I mean, that is, that is what we do for a living. Uh, and that's why we're bringing this suit is because we there is no place for our emotion in this uh you know we have to channel their emotion and that is what we are going to do this is what we're going to do you know when we help a jury understand what happened here we are going to be speaking for our plaintiffs i told you she was the only lawyer in the country tougher than me <laughs> i meant it In the, in the hours after August 12th, I remember saying to anyone who would ask, journalism and lawyers are gonna save us. And I really think journalism and lawyers, in this instance, have done a, a, a more than creditable job of keeping uh, this story and this lawsuit um, alive. And, and uh, I just want to thank the Museum of Jewish Heritage. I wanna thank the folks who are watching, um, including Karen's family who are doubtless um, yeah. just falling away. And I want to um, I want to thank Karen Dunn and Reb Robbie Kaplan for really they are you are in the presence of two heroes. Uh, so uh, if you want to read something extraordinary I would say get your hands uh, on the pleading that they've described. It is like nothing I've ever read and I thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. <laughs>